us our singing this morning. I invite you to turn to Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 10. Philippians 4 and verse number 10. In this letter, Paul has completed the substance of his letter. And now verse 10, he begins with a few closing comments. I can begin reading of verse 10 through verse 19. Paul writes, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. You Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Well, Thursday is another Thanksgiving day recognized in our country. And I ask you this question, especially now in 2020, are you really going to be able to express thanksgiving to the Lord? Well, you think, well, certainly He's blessed me in many ways, but there are lots of things I struggle with, and uh, because of the circumstances, I'm somewhat disappointed. I find myself getting sullen. I felt myself even getting a little depressed. Well, the Apostle Paul in our text can help us rise above our circumstances and experience what the Apostle Paul felt in his prison in Rome. It has to do with a secret. And one of the benefits of the gospel is the secret, understanding it and living according to it. It's that secret I want to share with you from God's Word for the next few moments. I begin with the rejoicing of the secret. There's a rejoicing, a joyful aspect of it. In verses 10 and 11, as I mentioned, Paul is in prison. He has uh, been forsaken by many of his friends. He is facing going before Caesar and Nero and finding that probably he will be sentenced to death and executed. Not the best time of his life. And yet he says here in verse 10, I rejoice in the Lord greatly. And especially what he was grateful for was this gift that the Philippian church had brought to him. We're not sure what it was. It could be monetary. It could have been clothing. It could have been a scroll or scrolls. We're not sure of that. But in any case, he was grateful for it. And he says, in particular, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. So it wasn't just the gift was the fact that behind it was this concern. The Greek word means thought or thinking. I, I'm, so, I'm so joyful to know that you were thinking of me to the extent that you brought this gift to me. So he's excited about that in a very wonderful way. He has acknowledges the kindness of the Philippians back down there in verses 14 and 16. It was kind of you to share my trouble. Verse 16, you sent me help for my needs once and again. And even in verse 18, he is thankful for the gift that Epaphroditus brought to him. Now it's been a little bit of time since that has been done. So we don't know exactly how long a time, but it's been a while since he received any gifts. That's why he says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. Don't, don't misunderstand those words at length. Paul's not saying, well, it's about time. It took quite a while for you to get here, but finally you gave it to me. You look at the end of verse 10, he says, you have no opportunity. So he's acknowledging that. He's not criticizing them. For his heart really is full of joy. 
But then having said verse 10, notice what he said, does immediately in verse 11. Not that I'm speaking of being in need. He wanted the Philippians to know he was not sitting around waiting for this gift to arrive, as if he was completely dependent upon it. I haven't been pining away in prison, in sadness and desperate need. Please don't think that. That's what he's saying there at the beginning of verse 11. At the same time, he does thank them for their concern and he's excited about receiving the gifts. Now, how can he, on one hand, say, uh, I didn't have any particular need, but now I'm very thankful that uh, I have the gift that you brought? Well, it's because of the Thanksgiving secret that we're going to explore. And especially we're introduced to this Thanksgiving secret at the end of verse number 11. I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Think of the word contentment. When you think of contentment or being content, what do you think of? Well, maybe you think it's summertime and you're out in a hammock in the backyard swimming back and forth with a cold glass of lemonade. Oh, this is wonderful. Or maybe you just read a good book and you're with your coffee and you're sipping your coffee and thinking, this is such an enjoyable, contented experience for me. The story is told of a king who was very discontented because he had a terrible disease. He called his astrologers together and said to them, I am very discontented. What am I supposed to do? And they said, well, we talked about this and we're thinking about it. You need to put on a shirt of a contented man. So the king said, Go find that man. So off his servants went, they went throughout the kingdom, the days went by, and they could not find any contented man. But the one day, one of the many servants came forward and said, Oh, king, we found a contented man. This is wonderful. This is wonderful. Well, that's the good news. The bad news is he doesn't possess a shirt. And so the poor king was left discontented. Because he didn't have the shirt. That's not the meaning and the idea, though, of the word here translated content in, in the Bible. The Greek word has a completely significantly different idea. And it opens up to us, up to us the secret of thanksgiving. It's a Greek word used only here in the New Testament, and it originated from the Stoic philosopher Zeno. Interestingly, Zeno came from Tarsus. That was his hometown, the hometown of Paul. Both those men grew up in that community, but they had quite different views on what it meant to be content. The, me, the word means self-sufficient, independent of all external help, able to draw on one's own resources, and to exist without, without anything if necessary. Socrates, another Greek, was a great example, ancient example, of the self-sufficient man who faced with resolution all that life brought against him. In that sense, he was content. Now, what Paul does is to take this stoic term, but for him, it meant something different. It meant detachment from anxious concern about the outward features of life. No doubt about it. So in that sense, it's somewhat related. But as we will see, his self-sufficiency had nothing to do with him. Nevertheless, he was able to rejoice for the gift the Philippians have brought him and for everything that came his way. He was self-sufficient. Whatever situation I am. And I've learned this. I've learned this. It took a while. Started in Damascus. Went to the deserts of Arabia. Back to Tarsus. Then in Antioch. Lystra, and Philippi, and Thessalonica, and Athens, and Corinth, and Ephesus, and now finally where he is in Rome. If you read through Paul's epistles, you find this stream of thanksgiving, of joy, reflecting despite the problems that he faced. So in that sense, he was content. As we go to verse 12, we're going to look at the range of his secret. The scope of it. He's making more specific about how broad and how extensive was his experience in the matter of contentment. It's not just a little narrow part of his life, it's at the center of his life. He writes in verse 12 I know how to be brought low 
and I know how to abound. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to be abound. What does it mean by those phrases? Well, think of a river. To be brought low, a river would be down to virtually a trickle running across the the stones at the bottom of the river bed. Not much water at all. Paul certainly had been humbled in his life, despised, attacked, imprisoned. He voluntarily accepted his lowly position. But indeed, many times, he had run low like a river just trickling across the rocks. But he says, I also know how to abound. This word is illustrated by a full river overflowing its banks. Plenty of water around, suggesting a life of prosperity. And possibly when Paul wrote that, especially he had in mind his pre-Christian experience before he was converted to Christ. Because he was a very well-known Pharisee. And he was very thought of highly. And undoubtedly, he had all that he needed. To go back to Philippians 3, verses 5 and 6, he lists some of the things that he enjoyed before he was a believer. He circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Saul of Tarsus was top dog in his day, his days before he was converted. He knew what it was to be to abound. He goes on in verse 12 to say, I have learned the secret. You stop right there. Let's talk about that word secret for a moment. In Paul's day, the word secret was very popular, very well known, because it had to do with all the various mystery religions that were around in the day. And if you were to take part in a mystery religion, what we call a cult, you had to know certain secret things. And you had to be initiated into those things. And so, Saul of Tarsus, he was, as a Pharisee, inaugurated, initiated into the Pharisees. And they had the rules, they had the regulations. And so it was, if you wanted to become part of one of these mystery religions, you had to be initiated in there, you had to take certain vows, promised not to do things or to do things. We have these secret societies around even today. They're all over, certain fraternal uh, uh, organizations. And to become a part of those organizations, certain things you have to do. And one of the things you have to learn how to enter a meeting, perhaps. You have to maybe give a password. Uh, you have to uh, take certain vows, like I, I promise if I go against the rules, you can tear out my tongue. I, I think that's true in one of the personal uh, organizations I've read about. Um, you can take away everything I own if I'm not faithful to the rules of this society. So that was what was involved in being a, a secret or a secret religion. What Paul is saying here, I want you Philippians to know that I have learned a secret. I've been initiated into the Christian faith through the grace of God. I have become a part of the body of Christ. Because of that, I've taken upon myself certain vows, certain responsibilities. But along with it come many, many benefits. And so, as I live and serve the Lord, I learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Now, even after his conversion, even during his apostleship, Paul was blessed in many ways. As he traveled around different churches, undoubtedly they, they put him up in nice uh, uh, accommodations of the day. Uh, gave him a room by himself and a bed, and so on and so forth, and gave him food to eat, and down he made very well. He made it very well. He, uh, he didn't just eat crackers and beans and drink river water and sleep under a bridge. No, he was blessed in many ways. He knew what it was to have plenty, to be in abundance. But he also knew times of hunger and need. And the concept seems to the sport support the fact that this time he not necessarily hungry, but he was certainly in need, need of friendship, need of companionship, need of encouragement as he sat in the prison there in Rome. Have you ever 
consider how difficult it must have been for Saul of Tarsus to find himself now as Paul the Apostle in these kinds of circumstances. You know, I looked at verses 3 and or 5 and 6 of chapter 3. I want to take you back now to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 at verse 23. Paul's going to list some of the things that he's endured as an apostle, a servant of Christ. Listen to what he says. He talks about, at the end of verse 23, far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I've received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there's the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Now, what a life! How many difficulties and challenges he had been faced, the variety of them, the extremes of them. Take an illustration of a yo yo. It's up, it's down. Up, and down. That was Paul's life. Moments of plenty, moments of abundance, and moments of hunger, moments of need. And of course, we look at our own lives. We say, well, I just cut out my life. It's good, especially in 2020. I've had some good times of all of them. I've had some tough times. But then the Lord kind of brings some good things to me, and then we come back down again. But I think I have my life together, and all of a sudden I feel like my life's not getting together. Sometimes I feel I know where I'm going, and other times I'm not sure where I'm going. No, you will life. That was Paul. He's expressed it here in our text this morning. In 1 Timothy 6, 6 and 8, he says, There is great gain in godliness and contentment. If we have food and clothing, then these we will be content. And we have to acknowledge the fact that the Lord just does not give us a continued life of prosperity and abundance. Nor does He give us constant adversities. Instead, sometimes He reaches into our adversities and brings up times of prosperity. Or times of prosperity, He humbles us and brings us down. We have this yo-yo life going on all the time. But Paul says, I've learned a secret. The secret is that I can remain self-sufficient. I can remain in a position where I can handle these things. I read about some Episcopalians that were urged to pray every day, give us minds always contented with our present condition. Imagine waking up every day and saying that to the Lord, Lord, give us minds, or give me a mind, Always content with our or my present condition. But it sort of enables to go forth with very thankful hearts and joyful hearts. It's important for me to point out that Paul in prison here was not content in being in chains. He'd rather not have them, but he was content with them. He had heard to live with them. He was not content with being in any kind of poverty. But he could live with that. When he had money, he wouldn't renounce it. He'd be thankful for it. If he didn't have it, he could live with that. Whatever the situation, he says, in any and every circumstance, I learned the Thanksgiving secret. But we haven't quite got to the heart of it yet, have we? Does it mean that Paul had come to the point? He has such strong self-discipline that he can do this. Or he was fixed in his resolution like the Stoics. Nor similar to William Henry's well-known poem, I am the captain of my faith, the master of my soul. Then how Paul did it? Did he do it because of a certain native ability that he had or the vigor of his mind and body? He 
sort of talk to himself and say, come on, Paul, get a hold of yourself. You can do this. You can face this. No. His strength was ridiculous from his Redeemer, his Savior. Verse 13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. If you learn this verse in the King James Version, you learn this way. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But recent Bible scholarship has found that probably the words through Christ were not part of the original. And so it does not appear in the, the latest version, such as the English Standard Version that I'm reading here. But it does say, through him, who obviously is Jesus Christ. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.12, Paul does say, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord. It makes it very specific there. Back in chapter 1, verse 21, For to me, to live is Christ. That's at the center of his life. Chapter 3, verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Paul knew he could never be separated from the Savior and his Lord, Jesus Christ. Theologians call this union with Christ, the mystical union with Christ. When Jesus comes into our life, when we turn our life over to him, when we rest upon him alone for our salvation, he does identify with us. The Spirit dwells within us, then believers. And we know that He never leaves us nor forsakes us. In all the circumstances of life, Paul realized that Jesus was with him. Yet for us, we think that any kind of contentment, any kind of ability to deal with the situations of life can come only by different circumstances that are better. A better position, a better job, a better salary, a better honor, a better house, a better car, a better health, a better this, a better that. It is interesting how discontentment seems to continue over and over in our lives. Biblical contentment does not depend on what one has, nor how much one has, nor where one is, but who one is. For Paul, he was in Christ. In Him, that's how I found this, to find the strength to deal with all things. Alexander McLaren wrote, A fortress that has a deep well in the yard and plenty of provisions within is the only one that can hold out. Paul was like a fortress, with Jesus at the center of that fortress. But what does he mean by all things? The statement does not make Paul a wonder worker. It does not mean he was some kind of a superman able to leap over tall buildings at a single bound. Nothing like that. Surely we have to apply these things to what he's just said in verses 11 and 12. These circumstances of life, these ups and downs, all in these things, I can endure because Christ strengthens me for that. So if you're a believer here this morning, and your trust is in Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord, you can claim this verse. This is not just Paul's verse. No, no one else can have it. Any believer should be able to say that and claim it. I can do all things through Him, through Christ who strengthens me. Verse 19, Paul says, my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. He does not say, My God will supply every desire of yours. He does not say everything you want, but everything you need, the basics of life. He will be there to provide for you. One more word we need to look at in verse 13. It's a little word. The word do. I can do all things. A believer is not to sit back and do nothing, believing, as it were, in Christ to do everything. Of course not. We have to use our God-given minds and abilities to improve our circumstances. 
For example, when we get ill, when we get sick, we want to take advantage of our doctor, medicines, hospitals if necessary. We don't just sit back and dwell on our illness. We want to do something about it. But while we do that, Christ is there working with us. Back in the second chapter of Philippians, at the end of verse 12, Paul says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Doesn't mean we have to earn our salvation, but once we have it, by faith only, we work it out, we develop it, we bring it to fruition. But Paul goes on and says in verse 13, For it is God who works in you, both the will and the work, for his good pleasure. Dr. Roy Warren, commenting upon those verses in the second chapter, says, The principles expressed here give proper place to the regenerated personality of the Christian. It neither minimizes nor magnifies that place. It does not tell us that the Christian does everything for himself, nor does it teach that God does everything for the Christian. We need to give him responsibilities and effort. I must do, and he must enable me to do. I must act, and he must enable me to act. I must speak, and he must enable me to speak. I must work, and he must enable me to work. This day, many, many years ago, John D. Rockefeller is one of the wealthiest men in the world. And people come to him asking for advice of all kinds. And one day, he was approached with this question, how much does it take to satisfy a man? Rockefeller thought for a moment, and this was his answer. Just a little bit more than he has. Just a little bit more. Is that the reason for our discontent? Is that the reason that this year we may not be as thankful? Because, well, the Lord's given me a lot. And I guess I can be thankful for that, but I just need just a little more blessing. Just a little more help. But I'm missing something here. And because of that, we feel we cannot fully express thanksgiving. It should not be the way it is. Here in our text, Paul gives us the secret of thanksgiving. We are to be thankful for whatever good things God gives, and why does He give us much? Many, many benefits. But we also should be thankful to accept the bad things that enter our life, because we know that He is working His purposes out even through them. Through it all, we depend upon Christ and strengthen us to deal with those kinds of things. So here Paul was, probably in the saddest hour, chained to a Roman soldier, forsaken by his friends, facing going before the Caesar, and probable death. Nevertheless, he was content, he was thankful, he was joyful, because he was in Christ. I ask you who are here, and those who are hearing my voice and live stream, do you know Him? Do you know Jesus Christ? Do you have deep in your heart that joy, that thanksgiving, that ability to recognize that Christ is at the center of your life? He will never leave you, He will never forsake you. That's the glory of the gospel that God has entered into our world and given us that hope to faith in Christ. Well, if you can say that, then in whatever situation you find yourself, you should be contented, joyful, and thankful. And say with Paul, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Happy Thanksgiving. Join me in prayer. Lord, this is an encouraging part of your word because we are so mindful of our discontent are griping, or complaining. And Christ can sometimes it turns against you. We ask God, where are you? Why are you doing this? Why aren't you doing that for me? Oh Lord, help us to trust in your sovereign good ways and play good pleasure. How we do thank you for the many benefits you poured out upon us. We ask you to give us the strength of Jesus that we need when we face things that are not as good. Oh Lord. May we have thankful hearts this Thanksgiving season. 
May each day, may we arise prepared to give you gratitude for what you've done for us, especially in Jesus our Savior, whose name we pray.